So hello and welcome to our Pigmented Lesions webinar today with the fantastic Dr. Nick Lowe, who is a world-renowned dermatologist and uh, is going to be just sharing with us today lots of pigmented lesions, when to treat them, when to be cautious, um, and just looking at the different you know, um, ways of um, assessing and identifying what it is that you see on the skin and knowing whether or not it is safe to treat or whether we actually need to refer. And uh, so thank you for joining us, Nick. Sorry about the technical problems so far. Sorry we can't see you and we can only hear you, but thanks for coming and joining us. My pleasure, Hayley, and uh, we'll... We can proceed if everybody can hear me and I've got the copies of the slides in front of me, so that'd be great. Yeah, super. All right, lovely. So um, for those of you that don't know us, I'll just give you a very quick um, introduction. So um, we're the UK's leading laser manufacturer. We do manufacture um, most of our lasers in um, Manchester, just south of Manchester. And we also distribute lasers for some world leading companies as well but we're a spin-off company from a university. So from the University of Manchester, uh, we were set up 25 years ago. And funnily enough, one of the first lasers that we ever built was a laser for removing dermal pigment. It was a Q-switch laser. And we're gonna be talking about that laser quite a lot today in this webinar, because a Q-switch is a fantastic laser to remove pigment with. And back in the day when um, hospitals were treating a huge amount of pigmented lesions, um, you know, the, 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 the leap forward in Q-switch technology was really phenomenal and Linton were really pioneers in that technology. We built one of the world's first Q-switches to remove dermal pigment, gave them to lots of NHS hospitals to clinically trial them and had some fantastic results with them. So we're a medically approved um, a, and certified um, manufacturer of medical devices. Um, and as well as our medical and our aesthetic devices, we also do some conservation devices. So the same technology that we'll be talking about today, that Q-switch to remove the pigment in the skin, is the same Q-switch technology that we use to remove pigment on statues, on buildings, on artifacts, that dirt and that pollution that builds up. Um, if anyone ever comes to see us at head office, please ask us if you can have a go at this, because we've often got some kind of artifact knocking about the building and this is one of those really satisfying treatments to do so well not so much a treatment but just a bit of fun so if you're ever in our office find me give me a shout and we'll go and laser some some dirt off some statues but that's not what we're talking about today we're going to be talking about identifying different pigmented lesions and so on so as i said we're really delighted to be joined by dr nick Lowe who is an expert in the treatment of these lesions and is going to share some of his tips and advice with us today. So Nick, can I hand over to you? And whenever you need me to just move on the slide, just give me a nod and I'll, I'll move them on. Yeah, that's great, uh, Hayley, and uh, thanks very much. Yeah, and um, uh, I'm going to review for you some important aspects of, uh, of, of pigmented skin lesions. And uh, the key with these is there are some uh, that can certainly be uh, very safely and successfully treated with uh, lasers and uh, some other treatments as well. Uh, but there are some that you need to be aware of can be uh, uh, pigment cancers such as melanoma, where you really, if in doubt, need to, uh, ident uh, need to refer on for further examination. So let's go to the next slide, Haley. Yeah. Yeah. That's the introduction. So, as I've said, this is just a, a summary. Uh, what we'll try and do is to identify some of the common and different pigmented lesions that you'll see in your practices. Um, try and get a guideline, produce a guideline to what are the suspicious lesions where we, you need to uh, refer on, and often skin biopsies and exa special dermoscopic examinations are needed. Um, those that can be treated successfully, what are the best ways of treating them, uh, when to treat and when not to treat is, is actually basically uh, what I'm going to just review in this talk. So the next slide uh, should be the four pictures of some different uh, pigmented lesions. Yeah. And the face um, uh, on the top left 
is what we call a benign lentigo or solar lentigo. Uh, and that's the common so-called age spot. And if you look at that, you can see that it's relatively uniform in color. Uh, the outline uh, is irregular, and I'll come back onto that in a moment, but because of the uniformity of color, uh, this is um, almost certainly a benign uh, uh, lentigo and can be treated with a laser. Uh, the one on the right uh, are a number of different lesions, and they're a combination of pigmented uh, benign nevi, but uh, moles, but there is one in the center there that does look a little atypical. If you look, it stands out a little bit more other, rather than the others. It's a darker color. The color is slightly irregular. So that might be one that uh, should be referred. The bottom left is definitely an atypical, uh, irregularly pigmented, irregular, uh, different colors. You've got red, brown, and uh, black, and that is uh, almost certainly a malignant melanoma. And then the uh, one on the lower right, which is, uh, shows a considerable amount of, of uh, sun damage, photo damage, with um, a lot of abnormal pigments, scale, etc. They are a combination of what we call benign pigmented seborrheic keratoses and uh, another uh, group of solar keratoses. So that's sort of some of the more common, but fortunately the melanoma is less common, but certainly common enough to be uh, of great importance to uh, recognize. Next slide. And how does, um, how does pigment actually form in the skin? Uh, the basal cell layer of the epidermis contains uh, melanocytes, which produce pigment. In all skin types, interestingly, uh, whether they're very dark skin of color, uh, black skin, Asian skin, Caucasian skin, even redheads, there's one melanocyte to every 10 uh, keratinocytes. So there's always that one in 10 ratio. And the reason that you get different colored skin, different intensities of color, is that the pigment is able to be more efficiently transferred to the other keratinocytes, for example, in black skin. Uh, the darker black skin is much more efficient uh, than uh, Caucasian skin at producing pigment because it packages the pigment more efficiently in melanosomes and it transfers the pigment much more efficiently into keratinocytes. So that's basically uh, why the different skin phototypes occur. And what we think happens with uh, sun damage is that there's local areas of, uh, of um, uh, genetic damage to the uh, cells that uh, then are programmed to incorporate more melanin and transfer more melanin into the neighboring keratinocytes that then produces the brown spots and sunspots that we know uh, as uh, lentigo, freckles, birthmarks. Birthmarks often, of course, are programmed themselves to produce more intense pigment. So that, that's basically a broad overview of how um, uh, pigment produces in the skin. So the next slide is, is an important one. And the look at, if you're seeing somebody that you may uh, have uh, brown patches on their skin, and certainly we'll look at some of the more common ones, but what do you actually look for to make sure that uh, it may or may not be uh, cancerous? And it's basically the, the A, B, C, D, and E uh, uh, signs. Uh, e, I think, is, is important. Any recent, uh, the other thing is any recent change. So if there's been a, a recent change, whether it be crusting, scabbing, bleeding, sudden darkening, even sudden lightening, uh, that, that should raise your suspicions. If it's a gradual change, it's usually, but not always, uh, benign. The shape of the outline of the lesions, is it asymmetrical? Uh, that's not always the case. Asymmetry can certainly be present, as I showed you, in lentigo. 
but are the borders even? Do they sort of spread out? Are they indistinct? If the borders are spreading out, if they're not quite distinct, that's another clue you may be dealing with a, uh, a skin cancer, a melanoma. When you've got multiple colors, as one of the ones I showed you before, that's another clue that you may be dealing with a, a melanoma. Um, small lesions in general, uh, in general, the size of a pencil head, uh, are generally benign. That's not always the case. And in fact, um, if you've got other features with the irregular colors, et cetera, in a, a, a very small lesion, it is worth uh, uh, sending on. And then uh, the change in shape, color, and size, all of those, crusting, scabbing, change of color, redness, bleeding, all of those things can be uh, a clue that you're getting a change into a malignancy. One of the other misconceptions is that um, you have to have a mole to develop a melanoma. You actually don't. Some melanomas uh, arise what we call de novo, arise by themselves without being in a previous mole. And a suddenly appearing mole is again uh, something to be suspicious about. So let's go on to the next slide. So what are some of the things that we can treat? Well, this is the most common type. Uh, this should be solar lentigo on this slide. And these are round, well uh, demarcated, usually a uniform color, surrounded by normal skin. There's usually no redness or inflammation. They're always on the sun exposed uh, skin. So uh, head, neck, uh, and hands, forearms often, lower legs in women, particularly if they're have uh, worn shorts, etc. Um, the great majority of people uh, will get some form of solar lentigo over the age of 60. And uh, you do get on biopsies, you do get increased melanocytes, you also get increased melanin transfer. And um, uh, they're, they're distinct from freckling. Freckling, uh, which where I think many of us are familiar with most commonly in redheads, but also in fair-haired individuals uh, will darken on exposure to sunlight. Lentigo tends to remain the same, although it's interesting, lentigos often show up more when the surrounding skin is paler. So ironically, lentigos sometimes are more uh, obvious, um, certainly on Caucasian skin, uh, that tans during the winter months when the surrounding skin is paler. And that's often when patients come in to, uh, to be concerned about wanting them treated. So let's go on to the next slide, which should uh, just illustrate a number of, uh, uh, of the different um, pigmented lesions that can be considered for treatment with lasers. So uh, freckling, the trouble with treating freckling, and there are some patients who do have um, a lot of um, emotional uh, problems with having lots of freckles, you can certainly treat them with, for example, the uh, ruby, the alexandrite, the ND YAG, or even the pulse light, and you will get some fading, but they generally always come back with time. And so I try and uh, reassure them that their freckles are normal. But those that can, do want to be treated certainly can be, and you can uh, lighten them with those different treatments. Lentigo, you certainly can. Caffiole macules, the, um, these brown birthmark type, flat, uh, uh, darker brown spots. Um, again, they can be treated, but they will often come back. Becker's nevus is a nevus uh, which is basically pigment plus hair growth. It's a benign, hairy, pigmented nevus. So any nevus that, uh, any dark congenital area that's uh, got increased hair growth is, is what is known as a Becker's nevus. That's often, if you're treating those, uh, we will often use both the um, hair removal laser settings, as well as in combination, some of the pigment settings, for example, uh, the Alex and the, and the uh, Ruby, 
and the uh, ND Yang. Seborrhea keratoses, in my opinion, are best treated with some form of ablative treatment, either a um, uh, targeted ablative CO2 or uh, cryotherapy, uh, or sometimes some of the pinpoint stronger peels. But um, caution is needed not to cause hypopigmentation. And actinic keratosis will come on to in a little bit. There's a variety of different treatments there. And then a variety of different benign dermal pigment we'll talk about later. Some rare conditions, the, um, if you will, the uh, oriental or Asian pigmented uh, lesions, the nevus of Ota or Ito, some benign nevi, blue nevi, and obviously pigmenting tattoos. You have to be careful with tattoos, which is a, uh, certainly a subject of a much longer webinar, but some colors don't do well. Indeed, yellow uh, tattoo may darken paradoxically with some of the pigment lasers. So be careful, and if they've had dark tattoo overlying yellow, you may be uh, causing problems with darkening. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation usually requires combination treatments with skin lightness as well as uh, 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 some lasers and peels. Melasma similarly. Nevus spilus, I look on that very similarly to what I talked about with freckling. And then should we or should we not treat any um, uh, in situ um, skin cancers? My opinion is not, and they are the ones to refer. Uh, and we'll talk as we go through which to use the pulse lights, which to use the pigment lasers on. So there we go. Next slide is just to remind me what I've just said. Don't use lasers for malignant lesions or suspected malignant lesions. Otherwise, um, you can conceal them, you can uh, suppress them, and the, and the, and the abnormal, the malignant melanoma can then be actually spreading without uh, either the patient's or the physician's knowledge. So what are some of the important uh, lasers? That, for sorry to interrupt you, Nick, but that's quite an important point, I guess, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I probably wasn't aware yeah. that it, it's not the case that you could make it worse, anything that your laser will do to increase the chances of you having that or accelerating that melanoma. It's just that you... You were, no one else will be able to see it as well. In it, so someone else that could have had the opportunity to diagnose it now can't because we've actually got rid of the pigment in it. Yeah, that's great, Haley, to point that out. In fact, come in and uh, and uh, um, join in, and uh, so it, it stimulates me to think about things as I go along. Yeah, that's a very important point. If you treat um, a, a pigmented nevus with a laser. If it's a benign pigmented lesion, if it's the right laser, uh, the right settings, you will lighten that uh, pigmented uh, nevus, but you will modify it as well. And so that doesn't matter if it's a benign nevus. And there's no evidence that I'm aware of in the literature that treating a benign nevus with a pigmented le uh, laser increases the risk of turning malignant. It, it, there's no evidence for that. But if you're treating an atypical nevus that's starting to turn or an early melanoma, you can disguise the changes that allow us to identify that melanoma. So that's one of the main risks. And so that's one of the main reasons why we don't want you, uh, anybody to be treated that has a, what we call an atypical mole that has a higher risk of going into a melanoma or a true early melanoma is because you can change the appearances when you look at it you can change the appearances under the dermoscope which is you probably all know is a special instrument the dermatologists look at a very ultra magnifying picture of, of, of pigment lesions and then finally um, if even under the uh, microscope when you take a skin biopsy of something that's been treated uh, benign, uh, a lesion that's been treated with a laser, that can look atypical. So those are all reasons why, if in doubt, don't treat. And can I ask another question, actually, as well? Um, 
so at Linton, we say that if somebody has a history of any form of skin cancer, that they're contraindicated to all laser treatment. Um, I think that we have to be sort of quite strict in the guidelines and the rules that we give. I'm just interested to know, do you treat people that in the past have had skin cancer or do you contraindicate that as well? Well, I think that the right way to, and, and I agree with what your, uh, your advice is, I think the advice is that those patients can be treated by a dermatologist, but only after we've gone over the whole patients with a fine tooth comb and a dermoscope to examine every area. And certainly I will treat patients, for example, that have had actinic keratosis or a basal cell cancer in one part of the skin, and they've got multiple areas of photo damage or lentigo, for example, on the face, uh, but only after a very, very careful uh, full skin examination with dermoscopy. So I think for most yeah. practitioners, refer that type of patient with a history of skin cancer. Yeah. Skin cancer history means that they have a higher risk of melanoma. It is one of those, uh, one of those increasing um, what we call comorbidities. Okay. Okay, yeah, great, perfect. So we're on to our lasers for pigment slide now, Nick. Yeah, and uh, I was used one of the very early um, Q-switched um, ruby lasers way back for uh, treating um, originally tattoos and, uh, and, and hair removal. Uh, so I must have started that about uh, 40, 30 odd years ago. Um, and the first, actually the very first laser I ever used was the uh, second one available in the United States of the uh, pulse dye lasers that uh, is now used routinely for birthmarks and um, telangiectasia. So yeah, the Q-switch lasers are extremely valuable um, and the wavelengths of the lasers that uh, are selected are the ones that are most absorbed by pigment and they include the Alexandrite laser, uh, the ND YAG laser, uh, the old Ruby laser, there's still a, quite a few of those around. And then we can use what we call non selective uh, um, lasers to reduce pigment, which include the uh, carbon dioxide laser, fractional, uh, fragmented fractional uh, carbon dioxide lasers. Very useful. There's a few other wavelengths as well that can be used. Uh, with a fractional laser such as um, a 1550 nanometer one. But then the other very useful uh, group of, uh, of uh, uh, products are the intense pulse lights. And they've uh, really come to the fore because by selection of the parameters with the um, specifically the different filters, uh, as well as the different pulse durations, uh, you can get really excellent results with, uh, with the pulse lights. They're not lasers and they're not uh, Q-switch. They tend to be longer pulsed uh, in duration, but they are extremely valuable. So let's go on to the next one there. So this type of lesion, uh, which is the solar lentigo that we saw earlier in close-up, uh, it's relatively uniform in color. Uh, it's a little bit irregular, but not too irregular in outline. Uh, and in addition to the larger one that she's got at the right eye, you can see lots of little ones scattered. So this is a sort of patient that I will frequently treat by targeting the darker uh, lesion uh, with the Alexandrite laser. And I will either use the long pulsed or the Q-switched. Alexandrite or ND YAG laser. Um, and then to the whole face, and I, uh, she will do very well, and she has actually improved and, uh, with the intense pulse light. So I'll get a more focused, more rapid improvement with the um, uh, pigment Alexandrite ND YAG and or long pulsed or Q switch, and then treating the whole face with the IPL. You may get, uh, you will get a significant improvement with the uh, larger uh, lentigo with IPL, but sometimes it does need a little extra help. Don't forget 
with IPL, as I'm sure most of you know, you do need to do several different treatment sessions, usually a minimum of four to get the uh, optimum improvement. The other thing that we haven't said, and we will do a bit later, is what about skin phototypes? This patient, I would say, is a phototype two. Um, but if you're dealing with darker skin phototypes, three, four, et cetera, you have to be extremely careful with using any lasers or pulse lights. Often these need to be something you can treat some of them, but you need to be very careful and you should always do a small treatment area first. So we haven't got a slide in talking about which phototypes to treat, but in general, it's skins one, two, and some threes, but do be careful with the threes and darker. If you're going to treat, this includes hair removal, et cetera, do a test treatment first, making sure you're not producing uh, hypopigmentation with your laser. Did, next slide. Um, Nick, just before we move on, there's an interesting yeah. question from the audience just on um, whether you would start with this first by using topicals or whether you'd go straight to laser or IPL. Yeah, I'm so, sorry, I should have mentioned that. I will always, I will always view these patterns as a second, as a slide the further down, but good anticipated question. The answer is with anybody who's got a pigmented area, particularly solar lentigo, anything to do with photo damage, it's, um, you must always think of uh, holistically combining treatments, and that includes daily sun protection, the use of appropriate skin lightening creams, which either can be prescription strength or non-prescription strength. You can even alternate and combine somebody with photo damage and multiple lentigos by alternating uh, pulse light lasers and indeed uh, things like uh, appropriate peels. So yes, you've got to treat them as well. And it, my advice to all the patients is, that if you are wanting to have your uh, lentigo treated on a sun exposed area, you're wasting your time and money um, treating them if you don't agree to a sensible sun protection, skin lightening, uh, home treatment program. Okay? Yeah. We can, we, we can talk about that a bit more as a slide coming up when we talk about melasma. So um, yeah, the next slide, solar lentigo, another example, multiple uh, lesions. And this is an ideal uh, patient again who was treated, I think, with, uh, with uh, IPL, intense pulse light. You can see there's a few little areas still remaining. And if this were at the end of, say, four treatment sessions with the pulse light, I would just go back if she wanted to and target these extra areas. The other thing that she's a good candidate for is uh, one of the uh, vascular lasers lasers because she's got a little bit of uh, uh, telangiectasia on her nose, but you've got less telangiectasia. And again, it illustrates after treatment how the pulse light can actually improve telangiectasia. So I think that's a, a useful slide. Okay, next slide is again uh, a slightly more one. This is from Dr. Gonzalez, but uh, this is the type of patient that I would definitely treat with a combination of um, topical therapy. I'd pre-treat with tretinoin, uh, skin lightening creams, uh, ideally for at least six to eight weeks before the laser, photo protection every morning, get them into that habit. And then in this type of patient where you've got a benign solar lentigos on her face, uh, on her cheeks and you've got scattered areas of photo damage elsewhere, I would see as an ideal candidate for a fractional carbon dioxide laser. In addition, I might also at that first session treat with a Q-switched or long, long pulsed alexandrite laser to the pigmented areas. So she's an ideal candidate and you can see the improvement with not only um, the uh, pigment, but also the uh, wrinkling and the photo damage. She's also a great candidate for adding in 
some uh, botulinum toxin and uh, appropriate fillers. And that's very safe to do both before and after uh, laser treatment. So next slide. I, another ideal candidate to uh, uh, consider, there's just a small number of these benign solar lentigo. So uh, you can see that they rapidly respond uh, with the targeted laser, either the alexandrite laser. Um, again, I'm, I often will use the long pulsed mode as well as the Q-switch mode. Uh, my impression is, and I think there needs to be more studies, is whether you get a longer lasting improvement with the longer pulsed than the Q-switch, but they're, they're very useful uh, both ways. And um, you will get, uh, this last one was one week after, you will get some progressively more improvement. And the dorsal hands, patients often forget that they need to put sunscreen on the hands even when they're driving their car because long wave ultraviolet comes through car windows and will darken it up. Seborrheic keratoses, the most common of all non photo damaged, non sun exposed benign skin lesions. They're a benign, what we call a hamartoma. They're a proliferation and overgrowth of keratinocytes, of the epidermal keratinocyte. Um, we don't know why they occur. Presumably, some uh, local uh, um, abnormality of growth factor. Um, they're not, they're not at always highest in sun-exposed skin. Uh, you often get many, many of them on the trunk of patients who also have them on the face, but they're often increased pigment on sun-exposed skin, and they usually rarely go away unless they are irritated. Uh, some of the patients who have a lot of um, seborrheic keratoses will actually uh, scratch them with a, a little bit of sandpaper on their nails, and. Uh, uh, some inflammatory reaction will often clear them. So they can occasionally resolve and uh, they will occasionally present with that uh, question that I had this dark spot and it's gone. Help, is it a cancer? So uh, that's very common. Next slide. And this is uh, certainly a, a favorite treatment that I will use and uh, I will use the uh, uh, carbon dioxide laser in a targeted ablative mode very lightly just to create enough thermal injury that the um, that the uh, seborrheic keratosis lifts off. Many other treatments for seborrheic keratosis, uh, cryotherapy, curatage, scraping, etc, uh, etc. Et you can slow some of the new ones down by treating the whole area with a a topical retinoid cream or gel. Uh, so those are all things. And you can also, once you've treated them, and again, I think when you're using ablative lasers, this is uh, really for somebody, a uh, physician who, who, who's is very skilled with that particular laser. Otherwise, you can certainly over-treat and cause hypopigmentation and scarring. But once you've got an improvement of the larger ones, if you look at the right hand, photograph, you can see closely some very early remaining ones, I would go over that whole area with a relatively low end, uh, density fractional uh, CO2 to try and reduce new ones forming. We have a, a couple of questions, Nick, if I can um, just yeah. go through some of these. So um, question about could you use plasma pen on this? Yes, I'm sorry, that's another uh, option. Uh, we've uh, been looking at the plasma systems in our clinic, and I would have to say I am not um, switching away from my local ablative CO2. I don't believe they're any faster. If you produce enough um, uh, injury, if you will, controlled injury to get rid of the seborrheic keratoses, the healing time is very similar uh, to the appropriate uh, setting with a um, a locally ablative CO2. So I'm aware of the work being done. We have one of the experimental plasma systems uh, and have had for some time and I'm as yet haven't been sufficiently convinced to, uh, to, to buy it, but uh, I may be proven wrong. And I think there was a question about the anesthetic that you use as well. 
yeah, anesthetic. If they're very small um, lesions, you can get away with uh, something like the Elamax cream or one of the uh, proprietor, one of the formulated local anesthetic creams, uh, putting them often under a, a, um, a saran wrap, a uh, tegaderm dressing to aid uh, penetration to a local area, wait 30 minutes or an hour and then use the ablative CO2. If they're larger lesions, I will inject uh, local uh, uh, lidocaine, xylocaine mixtures. Do you, do you have a preference on your local anaesthetic? Not really, no. I'll obviously inquire uh, for local anaesthetic creams. As I say, the Elamax is very good. We'll get the pharmacy to formulate uh, a high uh, folk, uh, concentration of tetracaine, lidocaine. And then as regards the, um, I'll often use um, xylocaine, lidocaine, 2%. Uh, and occasionally, if it's a large lesion, then I'll use them with uh, added adrenaline. Great. Sometimes, if there's a large number in an, an area like this, I might do a very local dilute tumescent uh, xylocaine lidocaine infusion. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Um, also, there's just a question regarding the um, so fractional erbium on Seb K. Yeah, that can work. Um, fractional erbium can work very well. You don't get uh, quite the same hemostasis that you do with the CO2, but um, uh, certainly you get a nice result and gentle fractional erbium is, uh, is, is very successful. As I say, fractional systems are very good if you've got multiple small seborrheic keratoses. If you've got larger ones, you need to do use some ablation. Great. Okay, so the next one should be a bit more on actinic keratoses. Um, yeah. Those of us, um, I, I mean, the only reason, having lived for many, many years in Southern California, the only reason I've not got any actinic keratoses is because I've also got a photosensitive uh, problem called polymorphous light eruption. So I've had to use uh, sunscreens most of my adult life, but anybody, that lives uh, in a sunny climate and more and more people with sunny holidays will have actinic keratoses. And then these can range in severity from being relatively mild, uh, often very uh, faint scaling erythematous to uh, much more uh, thickened hyperkeratotic lesions. Um, they certainly can proceed to seborrheic keratoses, uh, se sorry, squamous cell cancers, and uh, it depends on the amount of sunlight you've had. Um, certainly in placed areas and in parts of the skin where you've had a lot of sun exposure, in fair-haired individuals, you can actually get up to about a 14% risk of, um, of uh, actinic keratoses going into skin cancers. Um, and so uh, it is important that uh, these patients are examined carefully. Males more common than females, uh, simply I think because we have less hair to protect our faces, but also um, males tend to ignore the advice of uh, doctors. They tend not to uh, put on sunscreen. They don't tend not to wear hats. So I think more sun exposure. Uh, what I've put down at the bottom is there are several treatment options for uh, actinic keratoses, and this is where Again, I will combine other treatments, sun protective creams every day to expose skin. Uh, there's some very good uh, uh, prescription products that can reduce the uh, incidence of new keratoses, such as Solarase cream. Uh, some of the peels are very effective, salicylic acid peels, if they're multiple areas. Uh, obviously, the old fashioned fluorouracil cream, which is, has its good as well as bad points, the bad points being severe inflammation. And then uh, lasers, both um, ablative as well as non-ablative. And uh, then finally, uh, photodynamic therapy. It can be excellent uh, where you've got actinic keratoses over a large area. And this next slide shows somebody who's been treated with um, a fairly uh, 
aggressive, um, uh, uh, higher density um, CO2, which has uh, produced a nice result, uh, he'd probably need another extra treatment. But this is the sort of patient that I will have on uh, long-term solar rays uh, gel at night, uh, uh, alternating with a, a, retin a, a retinoid gel at night, one night one, not one night the other, and every morning uh, broad spectrum sunscreen. And you will get good involution there and uh, maintenance. And obviously you can retreat uh, regularly every year or two years with the appropriate uh, uh, fractional laser. Um, very successful. Now the next slide is uh, what we try and uh, prevent happening. And that's the where you've got a superficial or atypical uh, lentigo that has been allowed to spread uh, uh, in this instance across the uh, forehead. And this is where you've got to be very careful of treating solar lentigo. Uh, some solar lentigo lesions, if in the suspicious at all, if they're irregular in color, I will always elect to take a very superficial uh, biopsy. Often it's the one area at time I think that shave biopsies are extremely valuable done by a dermatologist who looks carefully and well, we'll, I'll take a very superficial uh, sampling uh, and it, it, if it's not a um, uh, if it's not gone into a lentigo melanoma it avoids having sutures or stitches and you can then treat it uh, with uh, minimum, minimizing risk of scarring. But these are often uh, very difficult patients to treat. Um, certainly, uh, wide excision can sometimes be extremely uh, problematic with grafting. So the secret here is try and prevent it in the first place by identifying it early when these are small. Some of the other things that can be used and has been shown to contain some of the certainly less aggressive uh, lentigo, superficial uh, um, uh, lentigo is uh, Aldara cream. Its, um, its uh, chemical name is Imiquimod, and that can be very successful. But again, these patients clearly need to be under the care of a dermatologist. Next slide, um, hyperpigmentation, very common, and this would be a skin phototype uh, for patient, Asian uh, very common Asian patients have um, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation after acne. Um, and I think combining uh, topical treatments with skin lighteners, uh, tretinoin, and sunscreens in the morning are vital to get started with. But sometimes when you're left with this uh, rather distinct local areas, the careful testing with a um, uh, uh, Alexandrite laser uh, is appropriate. I think here the pigment specific lasers um, rather than the pulse lights are, are a little more safer and we can focus them more. I have had some success where you've got a lot of post inflammatory hyperpigmentation, where you've had a lot of um, post acne uh, pigmented scarring, for example. We'll often use. Um, the fractional systems, low density, non-ablative, fractional, uh, longer wavelength lasers, um, and also uh, appropriate um, uh, chemical peels, but very gentle. The secret here is go gently and repeat treatments. Cathy Olay lesions, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you, but do you, um, with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, um, do you, sort of have a certain amount of time that somebody would need to be on a lightning agent before you'll go ahead and, and perform any kind of treatment? I think it's worthwhile with anybody that you're pre-treating with lightning creams and getting them onto sunscreens and uh, topical retin-A, retinols, at least two to three months. Yeah, uh, and you mentioned Alexandrite, um, Q-switch or long pulsed? Well, you can try either. Again, this is one because uh, I find that a relatively low energy with the long pulse can be quite successful. But again, uh, I would try either. And uh, if the pigment is deeper, 
Uh, I might even do a test with the NDAG. Mm. So, but so I think I think this is Moncourt. this is one. Yeah, this is Moncourt one. Gag, don't you? Yeah, this is yeah. one where you need to. Uh, I think refer probably. Mm. Mm -hmm. We contraindicate this actually. So, so if there are any Linton customers in the audience, you might be thinking, "Why have Linton told me not to treat this?" <laughs> and it's because it. Um, there's just a, a high, if someone's hyperpigmented, you know, there's a risk that, that, you know, anything that you do could cause more of that to happen. Um, yeah, I will have often had um, patients that have been referred on from um, uh, other areas, other clinics. So they'll have tried a number of different things. So uh, I will very, uh, go, I'll go, through, I'll, I'll be not, I'll be quite cautionary with the patient, saying mm -hmm. that we may be able to improve it. We will do a, a get you started on the home treatments first, and then to test very carefully with appropriate laser. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think yeah. if you're in, very, in the audience, and very you, unpredictable. Don't, very unpredictable. Yeah, it, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Best to refer. If you're in the audience and you're a, a medic, if you're a dermatologist, for example, then. Um, we, you, we are happy for you to do these treatments on this post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Um, if you're not, then we actually do say just don't, don't bother because, you know, you could end up going down a road with a patient where, as Nick says, it's very unpredictable. You end up making it worse. So just refer them on. And if you're not sure who to refer to, you can always just... Um, speak to Linton and we'll advise of somebody that's maybe you know outside of your geographical area you know someone like Nick that you can refer these patients to if you you know you want to make sure that you send them on to somebody that's got a, you know a good range of equipment. Um, there's a question from the audience just on treating um, PIH with IPL on a very light skin so would you say it's different when you have a skin type one and two? Yeah I mean I think it is uh, uh, Put it this way, you get greater success with skin types one and two. Again, the problem is with the IPL, unless you've got something that you've got a very small spot size, um, that can be a little bit difficult. And you can get um, square or rectangular changes that are not very uh, easy to blend in. So I, I, we tend not to use IPLs for post-inflammatory hyper. Mm. Okay. So we do have um, this applicator. I don't know if you're able to see me. I seem to have spent a few webinars talking about this block um, for our IPL. So this is a very, very, very small IPL applicator that's circular. So yeah, I if, if you've got that one of those nice applicators, certainly I wouldn't have any problem in doing a test treatment. But I think um, definitely, uh, I would say a physician that's used to you uh, treating uh hyperpigmentation and going through all the necessary uh warnings to the patient yeah i think it's um this is actually quite a nice one for you to use for all your pigment so what nick's um saying there is you know often these solar lentigos or freckles that we may be treating are quite round so if your device has a square applicator um it can be quite tricky actually to get that well covered um whereas with a nice round small tiny applicator like this that just works quite well so i just thought i'd i'd point that out yeah no that's great thanks Haley. um the next one uh cafeole lesions uh they often really uh by definition they they occur usually in childhood always in childhood uh quite frequent uh, there's a small in, uh, association in very few uh, patients with neurofibromatosis. Again, if in doubt, if you think there's anything uh, else, if somebody with multiple neurofibromas, they should be referred to a, a dermatologist for evaluation. Um, they never become uh, uh, cancers, so that is a good thing. If you go on to the next slide, uh, and you can get definitely some good improvement uh using um appropriate lasers in this instance an nd yag uh certainly the uh long or q switched um uh alexandrite and certainly in some instances the uh pulse light with appropriate pigment filters 
So uh, this can be actually quite successful. Interestingly, in this pay, uh, guy, uh, you've not uh, got rid of his freckles, but you have got rid of most of his uh, cafeole lesion. So that's actually very successful. Um, this is a, uh, the next slide is, is a relatively rare condition in this country. It's much more common in the uh, Asian patients. I do see quite a number of patients. In fact, we wrote up um, uh, a, um, we wrote up a, a paper some years ago on uh, success with the long, uh, with the Q-switched um, Alexandrite laser. And so you can treat them with either the Q-switched uh, ND YAG or the Q-switched Alex. Uh, and you can get really nice improvement. Um, it's rare that you get melanoma and they're usually uh, very benign lesions. If you go on to the next slide, this is this typical uh, um, very light gray pigmented areas, often some background erythema in uh, Asian patients. Um, some Hispanic patients, I used to see quite a lot in Southern California in the, um, uh, in the Hispanic community there. So it's not just Asian patients. So um, uh, interesting patients and uh, uh, this is the point of another um, webinar indeed, but it's when I was treating a series of patients, if you look at this one on her left, she's got those dark circles as part of her nevus of ota under the, the right eye. And we noticed that we could really improve that with nevus of ota. And we, it uh, led to us doing some research on uh, treatment of dark circles, but I've not got time to go into that, that now. But uh, interesting, uh, another aside. Very much more common condition, the next slide is melasma. Um, and it's uh, these patches of pigmentation, usually on the face, occasionally on the neck, um, always related to, um, pigment, uh, to the, um, uh, having taken the contraceptive pill, having had pregnancies. Uh, it's an estrogen stimulus. Uh, and it can be patchy, it can be widespread, uh, uh, and it's uh, very typical uh, and very frequent. More commonly in skin, uh, darker skin phototypes, as the next slide shows. Um, and uh, often, uh, it, interestingly, it, it, it's not just sunlight that causes it. It's now known that it's uh, visible light and indeed heat. Um, infrared can actually increase uh, melasma. Next slide, the treatment is very important to be, um, it's a multiple treatment approach. The patients have to be warned that there is a problem uh, with repigmentation. And so sunscreen is every day is essential. And I will use reflecting as well as absorbing sunscreens. Uh, on the patients. We'll use skin lightening products, including hydroquinone, um, uh, niacinamide, uh, alternating often with retinols and tretinoin. Uh, azelaic acid is uh, a, another good product that can um, increase, uh, uh, decrease skin uh, pigmentation and repeat chemical peels. Uh, next slide. If you've got, however, localized, uh, well demarcated uh, melasma, as in this case, you can use certainly the pulse lights. And what we'll often do is go very cautiously, do a test area, and I will often in this patient pre-treat with the skin lightening, uh, and then I will also start using uh, uh, chemical peels alternating with IPL. So two weeks ahead, I'll do the peel. Two weeks later, I'll do the IPL. Back to the peel, back to the IPL. And if they're religious about using their skin lightening, you can um, uh, also get progressive lightening. Uh, that they will repigment if they don't protect. Um, and they often forget and stop using uh, the skin lightening and the, and the sunscreens in the winter. And uh, they will then repigment through the 
with the UVA present in the winter. And then the other thing that's being used now, and I've used this for several years, is oral tranexamic acid, which is an estrogen blocker, which used to be used for um, menorrhagia, um, heavy menstrual periods. This can also help to uh, block the estrogen effects on the pigment cells. So it's a multifactorial treatment. And I will say there isn't a cure. There is ongoing treatment that you may wish to continue with. You may get bored with it. Interestingly, later on in life, postmenopausal uh, uh, women, they, you will get uh, often a progressive lightening of their melasma. And then the last slide is conclusions. So you've got many, this is just some of the uh, options, some of the targets that you can use to treat uh, with lasers. Extra caution in darker skin types when you're using any laser but particularly when you're treating pigment disorders, test areas are usually required, in my opinion. For pigmented lesions, we've talked about the risk of missing a melanoma. Always advise daily protection as well as appropriate skin lightening products. And then if in doubt, refer. Yeah. And that's the last slide. Perfect. That, that was fantastic, Nick. Thank you um, so much for that so far. We've had lots of audience engagement all the way through that. Um, and there's a, a couple of sort of last questions and a, a, some interesting discussion areas to just get into. Um, one of the questions just here is, um, do they continue using the skin lighteners during treatment? So I'm guessing that's for melasma. Do you keep them on the lighteners all the way through? Yes, they do. Absolutely. And there's no need even to stop um, the Retin-A. Some people say stop the Retin-A a week or so before uh, a treatment. I don't believe that's necessary. And uh, in fact, um, if you're treating, treating them regularly, um, you need to... Um, uh, that's a buzz that I've got something in about two or three minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes, you keep going with them. And you can restart the skin lightening literally uh, uh, the next night. Yeah. Right. right, Nick, there's one question which I won't be able to answer. So if we can ask you that and then we'll let you go and I'll, I'll try and finish up any other questions um, yeah, that are in the I'll, audience. So how, how long do you continue the oral um, transexamic acid tablets for? And do you use a topical um, transexamic acid cream? Do they work? I'm not convinced that topicals have been sufficiently proven. There are lots of people that are promoting it, lots of companies, there are few companies that are promoting it. I will, I'm waiting to be uh, found out. I don't think they do any harm, so you can certainly try it. Some have got um, um, tranexamic acid and other skin lighteners like azelaic acid mixed together, and that's fine. Mm. Um, I would, uh, any skin um, uh, lightener, um, as I say, we, we continue with it. Oral tranexamic acid, I'll start at, at the first consultation. Uh, give it, I always use um, full consents. There is a small risk of uh, historical risk of deep vein thrombosis, but uh, we haven't seen any as yet touch wood, but that is something to be aware of. Um, and um, uh, they'll start and they'll continue right through the course of treatment. Um, and once they've got maximum improvement, I'll then stop it. Mm -hmm. all right super that's brilliant well thank you very much nick that was fantastic sorry we did get off to a bit of a delayed start um but that worked really well, well yeah well if we can uh we'll get our zoom uh uh sorted somehow yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll just use it tomorrow and it'll be fine <laughs> yeah it probably will it yeah. was it was it was fine with one of my sessions earlier on so i don't know yeah what's happened yeah. Well, thanks so much for persevering and thanks for your time today. That was that No, was that's fun. great. And we'll touch base and thanks everybody for their attention. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Nick. Bye. Bye. Well, I'm going to stay on for the next five minutes or so. So if anyone has any additional questions or anything that you want me to run through, um, then I'm more than happy to do that. And I've got a couple of questions about our tattoo masterclasses later in the week. Um, and there's a there's a question just about the melasma, which I think is important one. If you're a Linton customer, let's let's just talk about our standpoint on melasma. 
Um, and yeah, anything else that, that you want to just ask as a final question, then pop it into the chat and we'll try and uh, answer these for you. So um, someone's just commented, um, sorry, I can't find the actual message now, but regarding how they've been advised, yes, Kay. Yeah, I mean, we actually, our, our blanket rule is to um, strongly advise you not to treat melasma unless you are a dermatologist or a medic. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, we, we have an awful lot of our systems installed across the UK. You know, there are there are, well, there are, there's probably thousands and thousands and thousands of people using Linton machines. And so if we just said, yes, you can treat melasma, off you go, um, then I we'd have a huge backlash of people who A, didn't get a result, B, made it worse, um, and C, maybe got a result and then, you know, a few months later it, it, it came back anyway. So... I think we believe this is a really, really specialist area and that if you're going to be a dermatologist or, a, you know, somebody that's going to specialise in the area of melasma, then we can, we do have a protocol for it. So we could release that, but it will, but, you know, we don't advise it, like I said, unless you are a dermatologist or medic, just for that reason that, quite frankly, it's, it is opening a bit of a can of worms, you know, it's not an easy thing to treat at all. Um, and they, you know, you see how experienced Nick is putting them under the care of somebody with his experiences is perhaps the better choice for the, the patient. So I hope that uh, answers that question for you. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so I think we've covered all of the pigment questions, but if there is anything that I've missed, then I apologise for that. A um, couple of questions on the, can we do this as a masterclass? Yeah, we actually um, do have in our syllabus a vascular and pigment masterclass. So um, we've done our hair removal masterclass last week. We're doing a tattoo removal masterclass on Thursday, and then we will at some point put together our vascular and pigment masterclass. It is a big chunky subject, isn't it? So it does warrant doing a full day masterclass. We mix it with some vascular work. And uh, as soon as those dates are released, then yeah, we'll let you know. We'll start advertising it on our social media. Uh, yes, we did record the tattoo webinar from yesterday. That's not uploaded to YouTube yet, but as soon as it is, then if you did register for the tattoo webinar yesterday, you'll receive the link to it. Um, if you didn't register, but you'd like to see that, then the best thing you can do is drop me an email. I'm on info at linton.co.uk. I'll put it in the chat box here. Um, and also we did a rosacea with Nick, not a rosacea webinar with Nick, um, not that long ago. So that's a really good one to catch up on if you've got an interest in rosacea. He gave some really good tips and advice um, in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you go onto our YouTube channel, if you go onto our website and just look for webinars, then there's a whole host of different subjects that we've covered over the last few weeks. And we endeavor to do more next week. We're having a bit of a business digital week next week. So we're gonna be running some webinars on getting all your digital uh, tools um, put together and sorted out, ready for going back. And then we're also going to do one on uh, a bit of business coaching as well. Um, and then, yeah, maybe a, con maybe a consultations one, we think. I'm waffling now, so I'm going to go. <laughs> but if there's any last questions, then uh, do please drop them in the chat. If not, then have a lovely day, everyone. Okay, so Kimberly, you've got the Lumina and you have the ND YAG handpiece. Is this different from the Q-switched ND YAG detailed in the slides? Uh, yes, it is. So the long, the handpiece is um, a long pulsed ND YAG on the Lumina. And it also has the option to upgrade to a Q-switched ND YAG. So um, same wavelength, 1064 but the addition of the Q-switch shortens the pulse, so you get a more photomechanical rather than photothermal effect. So the Q-switch will do dermal pigment, epidermal pigment, and it will do tattoo 
removal. Whereas your hand piece, the long pulse jag, that's doing skin tightening, vessels, uh, hair removal on skin types four to six and fungal nail as well. Uh, yes, we'll do another hair removal masterclass, but it might not be for another three or four weeks. So people in mid-course, yeah, we didn't answer this one, sorry. Um, so um, would you ever consider using laser and IPL this time of year? Yeah, absolutely. If they're looking after themselves, they're not in the sun, um, then there's, there's nothing wrong with doing year round pigment treatment. You just need to obviously be a lot more cautious. If you feel there's been any kind of sun exposure on the skin, then you would need to postpone that treatment. In anticipation of us all returning to practice, well, this is an interesting one, you know, um, PPE, social distancing, how do we go about doing these treatments coming back to work? Um, it's uh, something which um, if you are, we would advise you to speak to your suppliers. So speak to the people that are supplying your lasers, your um, topical products, etc., and get their views on things. Now at Linton, we are running for our customers tomorrow, we're running a session um, that's just a live Q&A to answer questions about, we're doing like a virtual coffee morning. So that's at 11 o'clock tomorrow. The, if, you're not, if, if you've not heard about this, any Linton customers in here, then pop onto our Facebook uh, page and join our Facebook group. And from within there, you can uh, find the details of our live coffee morning tomorrow. But, you know, there's lots of different, um, advice and guidance out there. I know the JCCP have recently released guidance about going back to work, etc. So there's there's quite a lot of good information that's out there at the moment to assist you in getting ready and prepared to go back to work. But first port of call, have a chat with your suppliers. Right, thank you everyone. Um, I'm going to pop off now. I hope you all have a lovely afternoon and look forward to seeing some of you on our coffee morning tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Bye.